Well, that was fantastic. There, she's not here, but I want to thank Becky Whalen and all of her staff and crew for helping to make that happen this morning. Fantastic. Now, normally when I start preaching, you've been standing for a while, but now you're all sleepy, so stand up for just a moment. You had a nice Sunday breakfast. You're in a climate-controlled room in a soft chair. I don't need to fight against that. Turn to the person next to you and say, every time I look at you, you look better than the next time. <laughs> yeah. All right. You may be seated. You may be seated. <clears throat> and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this presentation we've just seen and these wonderful children and all of the team that helped make this happen over the past several months. And Lord, I pray today as we turn to your word that we would receive the gospel of Jesus, the message of Christmas, like children. We grow up, we think we're wise, and sometimes it becomes difficult for some to hear this message that God, who created by speaking all of the earth, chose to come to this earth as the only possible way to pay for my sin. Lord, today, there are those in this room who don't know you as Savior. They're good people. They believe that there's a God, but they've never been born again. They've never come to understand how this baby Jesus came to provide salvation so that you might live in our hearts. And Lord, I pray today you move in their hearts and you move in all of our hearts. Help us to hear from your word today. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> 皆さんおはようございます。今日このように皆さんと一緒に礼拝をすることできて感謝します。Well,、uh, I am your guest missionary from Japan today、uh, for a couple of reasons.、Uh, one is we forgot to come by Albuquerque when we were on our last furlough in 2006 because we didn't know you. And two, because we're beginning our global missions focus、uh, beginning today. And so I want to share with you today、uh, the message that we shared. On our stateside assignments. We were in Japan for 10 years from 1996 to 2006. Four of our children were born there, and this is what we looked like when we came home、uh, on the picture here. And so you can imagine taking this family、uh, around Tokyo, and it was an adventure.、Uh, Tokyo、uh, is like when a football game at a large stadium lets out. And so、uh, you're tempted to want to wait, get off of a train, or you enter some、uh, place, and let's wait till the crowd dies down. Well, the crowd never dies down. So you just have to go and hope that someone will end up with your blonde headed child and bring them back、uh, if you lose them. <clears throat> Japan、uh, has 126 million people, and they live in the size、uh, area of the state of California.、Uh, very crowded. It's also very mountainous, and people don't live on the mountains because they're believed to be sacred, so、uh, it's very, very crowded. Tokyo, Greater Tokyo,、uh, has somewhere between 35 and 40 million people. It's like taking 35, 40 million people and putting them into LA County, and you think LA County is crowded, it has about 10 million people,、uh, and so it's,、uh, it's very, very crowded. When we left Japan, our assignment, our last assignment, was North and East Tokyo. So, our target area had 8.1 million people in it. We were your only Southern Baptist missionaries in that 8.1 million people. There certainly were、uh, other believers and there were、uh, small Japanese churches,、uh, but it was、uh, quite a daunting task. So, we came home in 2006. Now, Of that 126 million people, of the 35 to 40 million people in Greater Tokyo and in all of Japan, less than one half of 1% of the Japanese population know Christ as their Savior.、Uh, so there's great work still to be done. It was a struggle to come home.、Uh, it's hard to leave the mission field.、Uh, you feel like you're going AWOL,、uh, but the Lord made it very clear that we were to do so. I want to thank you up front, Southern Baptist. Um, the last year that we have records for, you gave incredibly to、uh, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, which is a part of our global missions offering, as you'll hear 
later, you have uh, some 3,700 international missionaries serving with the International Mission Board, and we thank you for that. For the last statistical year, 43,000 new believers, 4,500 churches planted, and 811 of the remaining people groups with, with access to the gospel. Now, the IMB's purpose, your International Mission Board, the Southern Baptist Convention, their purpose is not to do missions for Southern Baptists. Their purpose is to lead Southern Baptists in doing missions. And we do missions because there are still lost people around the world in Albuquerque, in New Mexico, in the United States, and globally. I want to tell you a story about a young lady named Hiromi. <clears throat> Now, uh, the Japanese government doesn't let a lot of uh, U.S. companies in, U.S. restaurants and things like that. Their idea of fair trade is not exactly very fair. But there are certain companies that get in. I don't know how it works. But one day, the doorbell rang, and I went to uh, answer the door, and it was two ladies. They were selling Aflac. Um, and so the door was about 15 feet from the lunch table where my family was sitting, and so my kids are in there going, ah, flack, ah, flack, at the lunch table. I'm hoping she's never seen that commercial. Uh, and so they told me a little bit about their, their product, and they said, you know, we, we don't own this home. We're, you know, we're foreigners, all of this. I said, but I'd like to tell you about something. And so I just quickly shared my testimony of coming to know Christ as my Savior. So of the two, Hiromi said, you know, I'm interested in that. And so she began coming to see us and coming to visit us until a day not very long later that she came to know Christ as her Savior. And you see here pictured Hiromi in our bathtub. Uh, we baptized. We were house church planters. And so we often baptized in bathtubs. Now, the Japanese bathtub is taller than the American bathtub, so it makes it a little bit easier. Uh, but we don't have the beautiful picture of going backwards, buried with Christ in baptism and raised to new life in Christ. We have more of pushed down between our knees, forward with Christ in baptism, and raised to new life. But here are some of our children huddled around the baptistry there. Well, the seed of the gospel has to be sown. And I want to read what Jesus said about that with you this morning as we continue to look at some stories from Japan in Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, I'm going to read the first 20 verses this morning. Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 20. And he, Jesus, began to teach again by the sea, and such a very large crowd gathered to him that he got into a boat in the sea and sat down. And the whole crowd was by the sea on the land, and he was teaching them many things in parables and was saying to them in his teaching, listen to this, behold, the sower went out to sow. As he was sowing, some seed fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. And after the sun had risen, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. Other seeds fell into the good soil, and as they grew up and increased, they yielded a crop and produced thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. And he was saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And as soon as he was alone, his followers, along with the twelve, began asking him about the parables. And he was saying to them, to you it has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, they get everything in parables, so that while seeing, they may see and not perceive, and while hearing, they may hear and not understand. Otherwise, they might return and be forgiven. And parenthetically, I believe these folks, like Pharaoh, have harden their heart, and so then God is uh, hardening their heart on top of the decision that they have made. But that's another sermon for us. But then in verse 13, Jesus goes on, do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. These are the ones who, beside the, who are beside the road where the word is sown, and when they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word which was, has been sown in them. In a similar way, there are the ones that, whom the seed has sown on the rocky places who, when they hear the word, immediately they receive it with joy. But they have no firm root in themselves, but are only temporary. Then when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones on whom the seed was sown among the thorns. And they're the ones who have heard the word, but the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. 
And these are the ones on whom the, the seed was sown on the good soil. And they hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. Well, the first thing is this. The sower went out to sow. This is the most important phrase in these 20 verses, is that the sower went out to sow. Because you see, the sower went out, and he had the same soil as the other farmers. He had the same seed as the other farmers. But without him going out to sow, there'd be no story. We wouldn't know about the soil. And this, this uh, sower, this farmer, didn't have anything particularly uh, extra going on for him. In fact, only 25% of his soil was good. But that 25% produced abundant, abundant crops, and we would never have known it if he hadn't gone out to sow. We Southern Baptists for a long, long time have been known as people of the word and people on mission, people who believe in the gospel and taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. And we're in danger. All believers uh, in the church in North America, we're in danger of getting comfortable, of sitting, of saying, what a wonderfully nice room, beautifully decorated, full of people. That's enough. Somebody else will surely sow for us. But we today have to learn to be the sower, the one who goes out to sow. The sower, again, had the same seed as everyone else. We're not told that he was particularly adept, particularly gifted at sowing. You know, there's nowhere in the passage here that says that the sower uh, would take one step forward and he would twist his wrist and throw the seed with a little bit of backspin on the seed, and it was an amazing way that he sowed the seed. No, it just says he went out and he sowed. And he scattered the seed, and with that, he found the results. And with that, he found the good soil. You know, we have the same seed that Peter had at Pentecost when all of those came to Christ. We have the same seed, we have the same message, and we have humans who are similar in their soil. So we've got to, as Southern Baptists, we've got to, as Christians, find a way to increase our sowing. Accountability is a great way to increase your sowing, letting someone else know that you want to. I mean, I'm trying to be your Olympic coach here because uh, most Christians would say, yeah, I want the gospel to get out. So the Olympic coach says, find a partner. Find someone that you can say to, hey, you know, I'm not doing this. I want to, but I just find myself getting busy, and I'm not sowing the word. Would you ask me how it's going? Or we could text each other, or we could email each other, whatever it takes to increase your sowing. And I'm presenting this challenge to you at the best time of the year. December is an incredible time to talk to people about Jesus. Hey, Merry Christmas. Did you know that, that Christmas tells me that you're loved? And then you're, you're in. Once you're in, you'll be surprised at what God will do to give you the words to say to someone else about Jesus. So you find, you ask God, what's my in? What's my sentence to get me in? We've got uh, cards to advertise our Christmas events. You say, I'm not ready to even say one word yet. Uh, take those things. Get them out. People are interested in coming to church at Christmas. So you begin telling people about the Jesus that this Christmas is all about. Now, what, what's better? Sharing the gospel, telling people about Jesus cold turkey with people that you don't know. Incidentally, uh, as a freebie here, I had a friend that said he was addicted to Thanksgiving food, but he was going to try to quit cold turkey. That's free. Anyway, uh, what's better, sharing cold turkey or sharing the gospel, telling people about Jesus, those people with whom you already have a relationship? Yes. They're both good. You know what I've found over the years? Sometimes the people with whom I share the gospel cold turkey, never met them before, even if they don't say yes, then we develop a relationship. And so then I'm doing relationship evangelism with someone with whom I initiated our relationship over the gospel. That also puts the gospel at the center of our relationship. Now, in Japan, we were Americans. Japanese people are fascinated with Americans, American culture. We had plenty of people who wanted to be our friends. And so we tried to, as best we could, always have the gospel as a part of those meetings and those conversations. For sure, some, as we'll talk about in a moment, went away. But many others stayed to be our friends, and they knew that they were going to hear about the gospel from us. And then when they did come to Christ, some of them, their DNA already said it's natural to talk about Jesus up front with other people. 
If your neighbors, your coworkers know that you're a Christian, they figure you're going to tell them about Jesus. Why disappoint them? Tell them about Jesus. So both, did Paul and Silas know the Philippian jailer? No, they just shared the gospel. Did Peter know Cornelius? No, he just shared the gospel. And so begin that relationship that way. We had an evangelism accountability group in Japan one time, and every week we would email each other, and we would just very quickly say, you know, hey, I shared the gospel with this person or that person, or this is how my week went. And so it was a good accountability. Well, one day, it was uh, Tuesday, and Tuesday morning is when our emails would go out to each other, and I realized, I've been so busy. I need to share the gospel. I've got to send my email. Well, I really hate to share the gospel with, with those kind of motives. Hey, whatever motives get you to share the gospel, share the gospel. Use them. So our family was going to a store, and uh, so I was walking by, and there was a worker. And so I stopped to talk to him uh, about the gospel. His name was Mitch. He'd been in America. His real name was Mitsuo, but he liked to go by Mitch. And he was looking for some American to have a relationship with in our suburb. And uh, so Mitch and I began to have a relationship, and uh, it was based on the gospel. And so they're out there. Do what you need to do to establish better patterns in sowing the gospel. Look for things that you can use. I was sitting there one time uh, with my kids at a, uh, a kind of a science museum, and there was a guy across the way, and Japanese people love to advertise with English incredibly silly things that you'll read uh, on things, uh, some things that you, you don't know whether to laugh or cry that they have found. Doesn't, the meaning isn't important, it's just the look and certain words. And so here's this, this man, and his hat says, Pearly Gates. And I was thinking, you know, God, thank you. I think I can do something with that. I think that's a pretty good softball. And so just going, hey, do you know what your hat means? He had no clue what his hat meant. And so there the gospel is able to be presented. Well, Hiroshi is the man presented uh, here in this picture. And Hiroshi, uh, we met him through volunteers. And we're going to be taking a trip. Some of us are going to go at the end of April to Japan from Sandia Baptist Church. We've pushed our application deadline back to mid-January. Uh, for that, the response is good, give you a little bit more time to prepare there. But volunteers in Japan are extremely, extremely vital. Almost everyone we saw come to Christ in our 10 years in Japan, we met through either volunteers or our children. In fact, when we were in language, uh, in missionary training in Virginia before we went to Japan, they said, if you don't have children, we recommend you buy some before you go. The Japanese people have seen American movies, and so they'd see me, and they'd think, you know, I'm going to pull, you know, an Uzi out of my, my jacket and start, you know, blowing everybody away, and, and so they're a little bit scared of me. I'd be sitting on the train on the way to language school, and I wore a suit to language school. It was a little bit of an, an odd duck, but the reason is there was a sociologist at that same missionary training school. He'd said, the people who are going to have the hardest time are male church planters in Japan. And I said, well, thanks a lot. I appreciate the encouragement. But the reason is uh, we're doers. And you get to Japan, and you're all of a sudden you're a preschool student again trying to learn this language, and that's your only job. And, and you've been leading a church, and you're, you want to do something. And so I'd be sitting there, and so I did have jet black hair at one point. And uh, so I'd have black hair and a suit, and so little old ladies would sit next to me in the noon trains who weren't so crowded. And the train would take off, and they'd look over, and they'd notice that I wasn't Japanese, and the next stop they would move. Uh, they were scared, and they're partly scared I would speak to them in English and need help. Well, so volunteers are fantastic because they meet you, you're going to go home in a week, and so they can give it a little try. But the missionary down the street, they're stuck with, with him, stuck with her. And so we met Hiroshi through some volunteers. Volunteers came, they interacted with uh, Hiroshi at a train station, and we developed a friendship, and we began studying the Bible together. And Hiroshi, you'll hear me say over the, over the years, Hiroshi's the one that we were studying the Bible, and he said to me one day, he said, I'm embarrassed. I thought, wow. We lose that when we read God's Word. We get so familiar with it. He said, this is not who I am. My life doesn't meet up with what we're reading. Hiroshi became a believer there in our last uh, city that we lived in, in Japan, and uh, just a tremendously fine man. Hiroshi was divorced. He was like most Japanese Salary men, businessmen, terrible husbands, never home. And uh, his wife finally had had enough, and so she left him. We began to pray for his marriage. Hiroshi, what are the things, if you were going to be a godly husband, what are the things, how would you speak to your wife? And he began to 
apologize. He'd never apologized in his life to anybody for anything. He apologized to his wife. He began to send her cards and chocolate. He'd never done that in their 40 years of marriage. They're married today, and uh, God did the miraculous in their life. And so I'll just thank the Lord for Hiroshi. Do you remember when Jesus was preparing for the Last Supper and he sent his disciples into town? And he said, you're going to meet this person. You're going to come across this person. You see, I believe that's the way it is with my every day. I think God already knows who I'm going to encounter during the day. And he put them there, so I talked to them about Jesus. But we get so busy, our lives are so full, how can we do a better job of sowing? The good soil is out there, but we have to find it by sowing. Well, let's look at the results here quickly. And I just said that for just to, it doesn't have any meaning about the quickly part, don't worry. Um, the results of the seed. The first result is we see, this is uh, as we're leaving here, uh, the seed that fell beside the road. Uh, here are those. Uh, they're, they're, they may be hostile, although that's rare. It's rare for someone to really get hostile about you trying to talk to them about Jesus. Uh, talk to them about prayer. And no one is hostile about prayer. Most of the time, they're politely unresponsive. There's so many that I could think of here in Japan. There was the bag salesman that I tried to share with that was unresponsive. There was a coffee shop near our house, and we try to go. It's good to try to go to the same place, even here in the States, and establish a relationship there. And I always go in trying to share the gospel with them. And I began to notice that when I'd go into the coffee shop, they'd all disappear to the back. And they weren't hostile. They just weren't receptive. Um, Here's the seed sown, and it says immediately Satan takes it away. They have such uh, biases. Here in the States and around the world, there are those who just, they've been brainwashed by the devil through so many different influences that they're just not there right now. So uh, we see them in our life. I think of so many polite folks, Tamaki and Mamiko and Shume and Tarao, who are so kind and wanted to hear the gospel but just couldn't receive. Well, what did the sower do? He just kept sowing. He didn't stop. And he said, well, people are unresponsive. He just kept sowing the seed and didn't let the response of the soil stop him. And incidentally, as we look at the soils today, I want to ask the question, which soil are you? Some of you are here today and you say, you know, I've heard this before. I've heard about Jesus. But it's just I've never been able to receive that. I'm too smart. I know this. I know that. But, friend, there's going to come a day when this life is going to be over, and it could be today. And the Bible, the most tested book in all the world, because it's been attacked more than any book in all the world, has been proven to be true. These disciples, some 500, who were willing to give their lives to say this was true, that there was a man who lived on this earth who said he was God, and he called himself Jesus. And history, not just the Bible, tells us that that same man died on a cruel Roman cross. And then history tells us that there was another man who looked just like him with the same name three days later, risen from the grave. And he loves you so much. That's what the whole Christmas is about. That's what our children were trying to sing to us today. That's why Christmas is here, because he came as the only acceptable sacrifice for your sin. But there was also the seed that fell on the rocky ground. And these, it says, they received the good news gladly, but they, they're shallow they don't really understand. They haven't really been born again. Uh, as Southern Baptists, we believe the Bible tells us that once you become someone's child, you can never not be their child. Once you become a true born-again believer, you will be forever. But there are those, you've known them, I've known them, that it seemed like the seed took, but it really didn't. There was an initial excitement, but they fell away. And this young lady, that's not the case here. It's just another picture of a baptism in Japan. But a couple of things we see here besides the example of the soil. One is how important discipleship is. That's why it's so important that we immediately link a new believer up with another believer. Because in some cases, there's a process going on. We don't know exactly when someone's born again. God knows that. We see a testimony. We see someone saying that. And sometimes it's even in that process of discipleship that someone says, oh, I didn't really get that. Yes, I want to believe in this Jesus. And then another thing we want to do here as we look at this soil is not tell people, if you believe in Jesus, all your problems will go away. Well, I look around this room, and I see that's not true. No, but your biggest problem you ever had and ever will have will go away, and that's what to do with your sin, what you're going to do when you stand before God after this life is over. And so there's some, they, they spring up 
and it seems like things are going well. But then we realize they didn't really understand. Ken Ichido met him, shared the gospel with him. We baptized him, began to study the Bible with him, trying to disciple him, and he just began to get more and more weird until one day he emailed me and said, you know, I, I think I, we better stop meeting. I'm no longer worshiping Jesus. I'm worshiping the angels and Joan of Arc. And I just thought, well, I, I'm not exactly sure how to fix that. I'm not exactly sure where I went wrong uh, here. So if you've ever had anything worse than someone you're discipling telling you that, the, that now they're worshiping the angels and Joan of Arc, uh, let me know. Uh, but it's just out there. So what does the sower do? He keeps on sowing. He keeps on letting the seed go to find the soil. What's the next soil? The third one is the seed that fell among the thorns. These, they've heard the word, but they can't believe it. They're, it says it's choked out by riches and by other things, and there's a, there's a want to there. There's a want to, but they just can't let go and give themselves to Jesus. Mr. Moriyama, wonderful. Uh, seemed, I thought he'd come to Christ, we were discipling him, and I really thought in Sapporo, we lived in snow country there, I thought this is the man for whom God's really going to work. God's going to do a really great multiplying work through him. He just seemed to receive and soak in everything. And then one day, as we were studying and having house church together, and we came across, as we were reading through the Bible, we came across tithing. And he said, how much do I have to tithe? And I said, now, Mr. Moriyama, uh, I'm not here for your money. Uh, but the Bible talks about a tithe meaning a tenth. God owns all of it, the Bible says. But if you're asking me what the Bible says, yeah, the Bible says that we take that first tenth as our tithe and, and offerings, and it's a privilege to give them to the Lord. Never saw him again um, until the day that we left that city. He came to see us off at the airport. Just can't let go, even though it seems like they want to. But then finally we get to the good soil. And this is the better part of the passage. The good soil, that person, they believe and they reproduce. And let me stop and say, if we're believers, there's, there's only one soil that's possible for a believer to be in, and that's in the good soil. And what does the good soil do? Reproduces, tells others about Jesus. We met Hiromi Takahashi, she's the one on the left side of the picture there. We met her in, in our neighborhood in Sapporo. And we put out a flyer in the neighborhood, English Bible lessons, just trying to, to draw folks in I mean, and uh, use the Bible as the textbook and then share the gospel in Japanese. And uh, she came, she was new in that neighborhood. We were new in that neighborhood. Kathy led her to Christ. And today she's still multiplying over there in Japan right now. Just a fantastic example of the good, good soil. When believers become believers, they reproduce. And that is the pattern. There's a pattern that we see here in Scripture. The pattern is one of multiplication, and we see it in all of God's creation. In plant life, the, the seed from this plant has the seed for the next plant already in it. In animal life, we see it. In human life, we see it. I'm not sure if I've told you this, but I've seen research that said if your parents didn't have children, it's likely that you won't either. <laughs> and I'm not a scientist, but that's what I've heard. There was a religious group called the Shakers. They had an interesting piece in their theology. They didn't believe in having children. There's no longer a religious group called the Shakers. I mean, it, you know, just do the math there. God has built into us a pattern of multiplication. And it begins with sowing. There's a message for us as believers in North America here today that we've got to sow. Now, I'd rather come in here with all the nice decorations and the, and the beautiful music and just say, man, just sit back, just soak it in and enjoy. But I'd be ignoring the scripture. And unfortunately, we're going to keep hearing about that uh, over and over really fortunately, because that's where the joy in the Christian life comes, in knowing that you're giving other people the chance to say yes or no, here and around the world. You involved. Now, as we look at international missions today, you can pray. No matter what age you are, no matter what your physical condition, you can pray. You can do it over the phone. You can call 
395 pray. I tried it again just the other day just to see if the, the phone number still worked. It still works. You can call and you can get a relevant prayer request from around the world from your IMB missionaries today. You can also go on the web. You can have them emailed to you. You can just go to imb.org slash pray or just start at imb.org and go from there. So many things. It's such a great day we live in. When missionaries in decades uh, past had to write letters and use carbon paper so that they could make multiple uh, copies at a time and mail them off and, and you get the prayer request a month later, today you can get instant prayer requests from around the world. Uh, the butlers have done a great job of uh, making sure that we have uh, this uh, IMB Connect. Um, sorry, it's wrong there, but you've seen it. Our, uh, our International Mission Board prayer request every month. You get a month of prayer requests, short requests that you could pray every day. There's so many ways that we can pray for international missions. We can also go. Now, you can go to imb.org slash go, and you can find mission trips yourself. We're working, your global mission, your uh, world missions team is working right now, planning a trip to Japan, working on another uh, front for us, another place that we can send teams to. We'd like to see the day come when we're regularly sending out teams around the world. And then as a part of that, God is beginning to call people from our church through short trips to then stay for six months and then to stay for two years. And then that we have folks, couples, singles, families from our church who are saying, God's calling me to go live indefinitely overseas. And you say, well, I, my, my parents weren't missionaries, so that's not me. No, missionaries aren't born with an M on their chest. You know, the doctors would say, well, look, this one's got an M. He's a missionary. No, not at all. There are a lot of folks at First Baptist Church Allen would be very, very surprised when they heard that I went to the mission field. Uh, they'd say, that rascal? Yeah, that rascal. Uh, God can use rascals on the field. You can go, and then you can give. You're going to be hearing even more today, and then next week you're going to be hearing about our churches, Sandia Baptist Church, every year. At this time, we have a global missions offering that's part of our global missions thrust, global missions emphasis and focus. And so we're going to be asking you to ask God, God, how can I sacrificially give to this, whether it's a one-time gift in December or any other month or throughout the year? There's a pledge card even in your bulletin today. Now, you're going to be led through that next week. I'll be in California at my son's wedding, and uh, Pastor Bob will be here and be leading us to make uh, a commitment to the Lord. It'll be your commitment with the Lord. You won't be uh, hounded by us. But Lord, what would you have me to do to give, to be a part of sending those missionaries around the world? And then hopefully then we'll be connecting up to help them by sending teams as well. But God, what could I give? How could my biggest Christmas gift be to missions, to getting the soil, getting the seed out to the soil. Uh, you won't be sorry, and I'd love to see us just blow the doors off what we've done in the past here in our giving to the Global Missions Offering. Now, what we do, rather than hit you with four different offerings throughout the year, we compile it all into one, and so when you do give to that, it goes to international missions, straight uh, to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, and you'll hear, hear more about Lottie if you don't know about her. Uh, she's not still alive, but we named an offering after her, and uh, so that goes straight to the field. And then part of that global missions offering that we'll give here at Sandia will go to North American missions. We support about 5,000 church planting evangelists and missionaries here in North America who depend on us to get started and to help them reach the lost who can then support those works there. Then also uh, to the Baptist Convention of New Mexico, to uh, the, uh, the offerings that help with evangelism and church planting here in New Mexico, and then part of that too to the New Mexico Children's Home. So you'll be hearing more about that, but begin thinking about what God would have you do to be a part of that. This next slide, just for perspective for us. In Japan, there's one Protestant church, and let me stop there. Protestant meaning super wide umbrella. Many of these you wouldn't want to go to, not gospel-centered, not preaching or teaching the gospel. Most Japanese churches have 25, 30 people in them. So you think of, in too many cases, not very strong on the gospel or the word, 25, 30 people, one of those for every 17,000 people. It's worse in some parts of Japan. In New Mexico, not one Protestant church. We've got one Southern Baptist church for every 6,000 people. Just to give you perspective, and this is the same way it is around the world. The work is still out there. The work is to be done. We get to play. We don't have to play. We get to play a huge, critical role 
in being a part of that as Southern Baptist so that we can join with the other Southern Baptist churches, the other 45,000 or so Southern Baptist churches in the United States, and we get together to cooperate, and then we support this work to every land. When you pick up the paper and you see a crisis, a tragedy around the world, you've got Southern Baptist missionaries there. Pray for them that the gospel will go forward because of that crisis. When you see a country that's closed to everything, there are only closed countries politically. There are no closed countries to God. And you've got Southern Baptist missionaries either living in those countries or living around them and finding ways to get into those countries, risking their lives in many cases because the gospel is that important. Nell Curley, 73-year-old Southern Baptist in North Carolina, in seven years... She led 1,900 people to Christ. And she says this, I love the Lord. She says, it's just my life, and I'm happy doing it. And I don't want anyone to go to that terrible place called hell. But no one is telling them. She said, there are lost people who need the Lord, and we need to reach them. So today, I ask you several questions as we close. A, what soil are you? Today could be the day that you become the soil that receives the seed of the gospel. That would be the most exciting thing for us today, to see that you, just like us, recognize that you're a sinner and that you need something, someone to pay for your sin, and that's what Christmas is about. So I would love it if today you feel God saying to you, yeah, that's you. You've never really come to know Christ. You've believed in God. You, you like Christmas. You like church. But you don't know me. You don't know that if you died today, you'd spend eternity with God in heaven. Today, don't leave this place until you nail that down. There are others of you who'd say, I, I'm that soil and, and I want to believe, but I just can't. And I just ask you to pray. Pray to God. I saw a Japanese woman do this in our, one of our small group meetings. What was your prayer request? She said, pray that I could become a Christian. I thought, I never heard anybody pray that before. She later did. God. Help me to let go. Break up my rough ground. And then believers, where are we at? Preparing this today has renewed the Spirit's poke at me to try to up my sowing game, getting the seed of the gospel out to the lost and dying here in Albuquerque. And then for us as believers, as a part of Sandia Baptist Church, beginning to ask God, God, how could I give? How could we just give so sacrificially? And this, no, I, I've seen God over and over. He blesses, he provides for a church that says, we're going to give sacrificially to make this happen around the world. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this beautiful children's musical. And then thank you, Lord, for your word. And God, I just pray that you would use it in our lives. I pray that today there'll be some who won't leave this place without trusting Christ as their Savior. Coming forward, taking a pastor by the hand and saying, I don't understand it all, but I want Jesus. Oh, God, give them the wisdom to start the Christmas season by letting you change their life. Lord, there are others who have many other things that you've spoken about today that I had no idea you were going to use your word to say. Help them to follow you. Those who say, I know Christ, I need to follow him in believer's baptism. I need to go public. Let them today, Lord. Those that you're saying, this is, the, this is the church home for you at this time. Lord, help them to stop waiting and just say, yes, until God leads me elsewhere, I'm in. And then, Lord, help us to be sowers. You're speaking to us about where we're at in sowing. Help us to say today, God, what's the first step? Just the first step to becoming a sower of God's word. Oh, work and move today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's